Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our next brand new section. It's psychiatry. Now, psychiatry on your exam has a lot of very specific things that are high yield, considered medium yield, and low yield. And psychiatry is difficult because it's not as much of a disease algorithm as it is so much picking out clues to the diagnosis and never forget that psychiatry it has a great deal to do with how long something has been causing a problem. And then in addition to that, psychiatry is all about is this thing, this issue, these symptoms, these signs impairing someone's ability to function. Because there are a lot of things that we do as human beings that are neuroses, but they may not affect our function. But when those neuroses, those signs, those symptoms, those behaviors interfere with our ability to function as a normal part of society, it becomes a disorder. Now, the psychiatry section follows the DSM-5. And the difference between DSM-4 and DSM-5 is pretty startling. The big one is that a whole bunch of diseases were just deleted. And then a lot of diseases were expanded in the vocabulary. That's the other side of the coin in psychiatry, in that you have to know the vocabulary. And what we're going to start in this first section here is childhood psychiatry. First thing we're going to talk about is intellectual disability. Now with intellectual disability, you notice that IQ is only used in statistics now. It's actually not tested, it's not a part of the DSM criteria. IQ is gone from those criteria. It's primarily used only in statistical analysis. And when they talk about intellectual disability, they're going to ask you, well, where are the problems in what domains of life? Exactly. If you said that intellectual disability is problems in both intellectual functioning and social adaptive functioning, that is the too big area. And now if they ask you, well, is it more frequent in males or females? The answer you're going to give on the exam is that it's more frequent in males. And then the most important thing you're going to talk about with intellectual disability, not so much the actual domains because that's obvious, because you're having trouble being a part of society and functioning in their ADLs, their activities of daily living. But it's going to be treatment, meaning what are we going to do for these people once they have been noticed to have intellectual disability? Well, the first is going to be genetic counseling. Now, can you do the genetic counseling? No. Genetic counseling is done by a genetic counselor. In addition, both the family as well as the patient have to receive specific guided special education and then of course behavioral therapy so that they're able to overcome specific areas of intellectual and social adaptive difficulty to be able to function to some degree. If I ask you what is the most common cause of intellectual disability in the United States, the most common cause of intellectual disability, what is it? Hmm, probably going to think of Down syndrome or you're probably thinking of fetal alcohol syndrome or maybe it's something else, fragile X. Which one is it? Turns out, fetal alcohol syndrome is the most common cause of intellectual disability. But if we say what's the most common genetic one, what is the most common genetic one? Well, there's two. The first is Down syndrome, and the second is Fragile X syndrome. So notice how they're different. Most common cause of intellectual disability is going to be an acquired thing through fetal alcohol syndrome. But if they talk about the genetic causes that are not going to be through exposures, it's going to be Down syndrome and Fragile X. Now, what are some risk factors for intellectual disability? Well, the first is going to be inborn errors of metabolism, intrauterine infections like the torch infections, exposure to specific toxins and heavy metals, poor prenatal care, actual physical trauma, and of course, social deprivation. Now, we're going to move on to autism spectrum disorders. Now, autism spectrum disorders is the umbrella term for all autism spectrum disorders. There used to be things known as Asperger's. They've all been removed from the DSM-5. And these people have trouble and problems in social interactions. They have trouble with poor eye contact. They also have trouble with language, relationships, and understanding others. A great deal of research is obviously being done in autism. Most important thing you have to remember is that there is no link whatsoever to vaccinations and autism. Other aspects of autistic patients is that they'll have stereotyped or repetitive movements. They have a great deal of difficulty with change. They don't like change and some would refer to them as inflexible. And more important, they have an unusual interest in the sensory aspect of the environment. A lot of patients with 
autism have difficulty filtering out input, sound, light, touch, and they have input coming at them in a very different way. Their brains are slightly different, and so you and I are able to ignore sounds, ignore certain smells, certain lights, certain this, certain that. For them, it's an onslaught, and that's one component of autism. And because of that, it causes them those, those stimuli are almost noxious. Now, what do autism spectrum disorder patients have a higher incidence of? If they were to say to you, well, these patients present with the following, they'll give you the prototypic case, and they'll say, which of the following occurs in the higher incidence of patients with autism spectrum disorders? You're going to answer seizures. That's right. In fact, 25% of them develop seizures. So then what is our treatment goal for patients with autism spectrum disorders? Well, the number one is going to be to be able to improve their relationships and improve the ability to develop relationships, teach them coping mechanisms to attend school, and then more importantly, do their ADLs and achieve independent living. However, if they have aggressive tendencies with autism spectrum disorder, antipsychotic meds are started like risperidone or aripiprazole. Now, what I want to ask you is, Autism spectrum disorders, is there an association with infections? Yes. The answer is that there are prenatal or perinatal infections that have been shown to be associated. Do you know which ones? Good. The answer is rubella or CMV. These are part of the torch infection family. And remember, early behavioral interventions actually improve the outcomes in autism spectrum disorder. So diagnosing the child early getting involved with both genetic counseling, behavioral therapy, medications if needed, can actually help them overcome some of their barriers. So your first question, the two-year-old boy who does not speak much, doesn't speak much at all, he does not have much uh, attachment to his parents, he even seems aggressive towards other children. They're asking you what is the most likely diagnosis. Is it deafness, schizophrenia with childhood onset, RET disorder, autism spectrum disorder, or do they have a learning deficit? Now, notice how they don't give you a lot of clues, but the lack of attachment to the parental bodies is a giveaway when it comes to discussing autism spectrum disorders. Notice how they didn't say anything about eye contact here, repetitive movement. A lot of those characteristics are buzzwords and don't show up as much. They'll actually do a vignette that they're describing the relationship to the parents. And you have to infer that, that this child has very little attachment. They must have autism spectrum disorder. Now, for irritability in somebody with autism spectrum disorder, remember what I told you, irritability, aggressiveness, risperidone, and aripiprazole. But there are also people who are irritable or even hyperactive, and those are people who have ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Now, for some of us, ADHD can be thought of as a superpower because they're able to do a lot of things, but that's only if they finish those things. But in the case of people with it as a disorder, it turns out that they have an inattention or short attention span. They're hyperactive. And how long does it have to be present for? How long does somebody have to notice these symptoms? It turns out six months. They have to be there for six months. And when do they have to begin? Meaning by what age or before what age? Excellent. They have to be present for six months before the age of seven. And if they ask you which gender is ADHD more common in, the answer is going to be in the male population. And the symptoms have to be present in at least two areas of life. That means most commonly in the child's homing and in their schooling. The parents have to notice short attention spans, hyperactivity. The teachers will definitely notice it. They'll come home with report cards stapled to their t-shirt that says ants in their pants. Somebody in this course had that when they were a kid. I got better. Now, first line treatment for ADHD, well, it turns out the medications are going to be that's right. If you said methylphenidate or dextroamphetamine, you are correct. But what are the side effects that they're going to ask you about? Ooh, they're going to ask you about side effects because everybody knows, I know that you know that you know that I know that you know that it's methylphenidate and dextroamphetamine, but mm, what are going to be the side effects they're going to ask you about? Because that changes you from the 220 to the 240. And those answers are going to be, well, you're giving a stimulant, and so therefore they're going to have appetite suppression and decreased appetite and insomnia. Now the exams are going to throw you a curveball. Here's the curve. If they tell you that the first line treatments have failed, which medication are you going to use next? Ooh, tough one. Think about it. It's on the tip of your tongue. <gasps> That's right. 
adamoxetine, which is a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, which has fewer side effects and less risk abuse. They may also consider alpha-2 agonists. And how do these work? Well, by using alpha-2 agonists, you're actually enhancing cognition and attention in the prefrontal cortex. Now, here's something interesting. On the exam, they will more than commonly say to you that before any psych diagnosis, what must you always do? And the answer is going to be exclude organic causes and substance abuse. Make sure that the person who has ADHD isn't abusing a substance that could cause these symptoms. Now, on your USMLE Step 2, I actually want you to choose adamoxetine over the other treatments. The reason why is because it has less side effects and equal efficacy. And so adamoxetine, even though it's not first line, it is the better treatment. Now, let's say the child started on treatment. You put them on either methylphenidate, adamoxetine, whatever the medication is going to be. The exam is going to then say to you, well, listen, you started the child on treatment. Two to four weeks have gone by. Six weeks have gone by. What's the first symptom to disappear after treatment? What is the first symptom? What's going to go away first? What's the kid going to do? What's the parents going to say? What's the teacher going to say? All of them unanimously are going to say that the child is less hyperactive. That's right, less hyperactive. Hyperactivity is the first symptom to go. Now in your book, we're going to go through this table about oppositional and defiant disorder. These occur in children. In oppositional and defiant disorder, they lose their temper easily, and they're annoyed by others, and they blame others for their mistakes. The question is, do they have issues with authority? Do they have an authority problem? The answer is overwhelmingly yes. And then who are they going to blame? Everybody else. My temper is not my problem. You made me angry. Yes, you did. And so what's the therapy for these people? How do you take care of a kid who has ODD, Oppositional Defiant Disorder, it turns out they need little people anger management. That means you have to tell the parents appropriate child management skills and sometimes even they have to have group therapy with the child and the adult on appropriate child management skills. Now conduct disorder you are much more familiar with. Conduct disorder is a child under the age of 18 who has persistent rule breaking, aggression towards others, there's a history of vandalism, setting fires, hurting animals? Do they have an issue with authority? Overwhelmingly, yes. And then they have to have had this diagnosis before what age? That's right, under the age of 18. And what is their therapy going to be? Well, again, the therapy is going to be behavioral intervention. And if they're aggressive, then they get antipsychotics. Remember, conduct disorder, big fact for you, conduct disorder has a high association with antisocial personality disorder, which we'll talk about later in this section. But remember, they're connected. Disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. I want you to just try saying that a couple times fast. Disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. It's fun, but it's also hard to say. But it's easy to diagnose. What is a disruptive mood dysregulation disorder? This is just basically somebody who's hangry all the time, even if they eat. They have chronic, severe, persistent irritability with temper outbursts. That's exactly what, doesn't this sound like somebody who's hangry? They, they need a Snickers, they need a sandwich, they need something. But imagine this person, even if they eat, they're still angry. And when do the symptoms occur? That's the important thing. Remember I told you, with psychiatry, it's not just about knowing the symptoms, the signs, it's also knowing how long and for what time period. And so they have to be daily for at least three months. And like I told you earlier, it must interfere with functioning. So it has to interfere with home, school, and their friends. There's a high association of disruptive mood dysregulation with adults with what? Good. If you're saying depression and anxiety, you'd be very correct. So what's the treatment for disruptive mood dysregulation? Well, it's going to be therapy and medications for their specific symptoms. The medications can be, you know, associated if they have a lot of anxiety along with it, or a lot of depression. We'll talk about those treatment modalities, but more importantly, it's the therapy for them to understand their symptoms and how it's impacting their world. That cognition, that understanding, that insight is critical. So your next child is a 10-year-old boy who has frequent anger towards others. He loses his temper in class. At home, he refuses to comply with the rules. He often stays up later than he's supposed to. Can first someone tell these children that taking naps is fantastic? When we were kids, none of us wanted to take naps. And every single one of us went to med school and now all we want to do is take a nap. They don't realize how lucky they are. 
Now most of you are nodding along like, "Mm mm-hmm, I know. It's true, I wanna take a nap right now. I caffeinated before this section. I am charged up. But if you told me to take a nap, I'd do it right now. The child frequently talks back to them. What's the most likely diagnosis? Is it conduct disorder, Tourette's disorder, adjustment disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, or learning disorder not otherwise specified? When they say not otherwise specified, they mean the umbrella term, and then there are obviously gonna be specific ones. But there's anger, it's persistent, it's oppositional defiant disorder. Your next child is a nine-year-old boy who has problems at home and school, frequent temper tantrums, and physically aggressive towards his peers, occurring almost daily since the age of eight, and almost always have worsened since four months ago. His mood is irritable and angry, with slight improvements during the summer months. This is also a presentation of disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Now, Tourette's disorder, Tourette's disorder, how is this diagnosis made? Well, they're gonna have an onset of multiple tics that last more than a year before the age 18. Where are the motor tics most commonly seen? They're gonna be most commonly seen in the muscles of the face and neck. They'll have head shaking and blinking. And the treatment for these is going to be dopamine agonists or antipsychotics. And the antipsychotics you're gonna use are going to be haloperidol, pimazide, or risperidone. Remember, Tourette's disorder is highly associated with an adult onset of ADHD and obsessive compulsive disorder. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of childhood psychiatry. I'll see you in the next one where we talk about mood disorders.